it might be of interest is this really cool interview because you don't really you, you know we don't get to hear from these guys speak too often but um uh patrice everett and gary neville sat down for a very intimate conversation talking about all things manchester united you know to being two very legendary man united players and um, this conversation came off the back of some fairly unsavory uh, videos that were highlighted at the end of the May United v Cardiff game, where a lot of some fans, some fans who were st in the stands when the players came around, were kind of hurling abuse at the play at the players, specifically Pogba, when they were coming over to kind of give the kids their t-shirts and boots and stuff. And I guess Patrice Evra, being a really good friend of Paul Pogba, felt the need to kind of come out and kind of, you know, back his friend and really ask some poignant questions. The interview itself, it was pretty round the mill. Um, you had Patrice Evra, who was willing to kind of, you know, again, like sit down and really spill the guts and kind of be a bit more personal. And you had Gary Neville essentially doing what he's always done in his entire career um, so far on Sky Sports, sit on a fence and not really commit to saying anything of any sort of value, right? Any sort of worth, right? And the thing that I have the issue with this whole interview or this kind of whole narrative that's going on around here is that for as bad as Paul Pogba has been, I really understand some of the criticism that he's got from some of the United fans. I get uh, some people are not happy with his level of performances. And I also understand that him being the most expensive player in the squad and coming from a high price bracket and the entire marketing scheme that was centered around him, Pogba and you know, the success he had at Juventus and then he went to parlay that into um, winning the World Cup at France. You would expect a high level of performance out of him, but I think what we've seen with his performances in Juventus and for France is that he's the kind of player who only plays well with a functioning team, right? If the team is functioning and it's, it's doing well and they've got all the right elements, he's going to shine. I think you put him in any other team in the in the league that's got a functioning side, whether it's a Wolves, a Watford, a Everton, a Tottenham, uh, an Arsenal for some 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 extent, uh, a Man City for instance, he would like he would shine. He'd be one of the best players in the league. But Man, Man United have got so many dysfunctional parts. We've got so many scram round square pegs and round holes that Pop was finding it really difficult to kind of show his best and to come you know again to show his best and to kind of uh, be the player that we know he can be. Obviously on his side too, he's got some obvious um, errors and obvious faults. On his side, he's a bit like whenever he plays for us, he looks a bit languid. He looks a bit short on fitness, but that also isn't um, a knock on him because I think in general, our whole team looks short on fitness. I'm not sure it's because we didn't get a good preseason in. I'm not sure it's because the training that um, uh, Mourinho kind of done and then um, the contrast from Mourinho's training to social training had them run down the hill. I'm not sure what it is. Um, he takes too many touches on the ball, um, which is something that you didn't see him do a lot for France. He kept it fairly simple. So simple that in the entirety of the tournament, I think I recognize, I think I made a point to a mate when we were watching France that he also didn't dye his hair in the entire uh, tournament um, playing for France. He kept his hair like the same um, dark black, whatever. He didn't he didn't do any funny designs. He just went to play football, and it looked like a he looked like he was um he looked like he made a concerted effort to just turn up and play the game. And essentially, he was you know one of the driving forces that kind of led uh, France to win the World Cup. But for May United, it's complete opposite, right? He's fairly much indulged in social media. He's dancing all the time. I think that might rub people up the wrong way, even though that's part of his personality. So I wouldn't really uh, put too much weight on that. And I think a lot of fans are a bit disingenuous because if he was scoring hat-tricks every weekend or if he was doing the business on the pitch, the same way that, you know, some fans were very forgiving of, um, you know, or very understanding and kind of took part in the joke of Jesse Lingard, you know, uh, dancing at the Emirates and stuff. When he did that because he was scoring winning goals, right? He was at the end of finish. He was at the end of um, breakneck speed counterattacks and kind of finished them off. But if he was missing chances and stuff, like the dancing in the change room right stuff wouldn't go down too well. So I get I get it. I understand the, 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 the thing about it. But the only problem I have with this interview, especially when it comes to Gary Neville, is that he was, in, he was incredibly... Um, again, he sat on the fence a lot. And for someone like Gary Neville to consistently come out and call out people like Paul Pogba, to call out some of the other high ticket numbers like Sanchez and stuff is a bit disingenuous because again I just think he kind of um he kind of purposely ignores some of the glaring, glaring lack of quality in our side when it comes to the English players or players that are kind of, you know, from these shores. Uh, and I'd like to mention people who like so Phil Jones, who still gets picked for the England side. Um I'm not sure why. He's a terrible defender. Someone like Chris Smalling, who Gareth Southgate is even deemed as not good enough to play for England. He can't play with the ball out of his feet. Um, somebody like a Luke Shaw, who's never really, who's never really looked at his potential. 
He came back from a really debilitating injury, broke his leg and stuff. But, you know, compared to some of the other uh, left backs or full backs in the league, like Chilwell and Ram Baseka, he's way, 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 way down the uh, the totem pole of quality. He probably is closer to like a Kyle Walker than you said, those kind of dudes. Um, again, someone like an Ashley Young, who Gary Neville was very um, curt with um, in the, one of his lances. I think people were like taking a piss out uh, Ashley Young. And he was like, no, Ashley Young isn't the problem here, right? He... Like, as in he tried to think, insinuate that, you know, we all know Ash Young's shit. He's just trying his best, but he's never, he's not talented. Yeah? He's not a world-class player. The one that is worrying is the world-class player is not turning up. But that isn't the problem. The problem I have is that Ashley Young is terrible and has been for years. We've been calling it out as fans and he's still here. We're still relying on him. We don't even try to play youngsters in that side just to kind of blood them in and let them have experience, right? We don't even play Damian, who isn't that great at all, but he's far better than Ashley Young. We just consistently... Um, pick someone like an Ashley Young, give him the captain's armband and he's nothing short of it. He's nowhere near being captain level or of that quality to kind of lead that team forward. And then you go forward in a team, you look at someone like a Jesse Lingard who hasn't played well in months. Marcus Rashford, is he fatigued? Is he just running into a brick wall? Is he just lacking in quality? There's players in that team who are much more deserving of uh, a rollicking from fans than Paul Pogba that it really does beg a belief as to why he's the one that's getting um, singled out by the fans. Again, it might just be frustration because I think Looking at Paul Pogba, you'd think he's going to be Steven Gerrard, right? You'd think he's going to be Frank Lampard. He's going to be able to drag us through. Um, he's able to drag us through matches, kicking and screaming. Get us, like, essentially, like, you know, do you remember that uh, famous game that Steven Gerrard scored, that screamer against West Ham? I think it was FA Cup. And he was essentially playing on one leg, right? He had a cramp or something. Um, that's not that's not Paul Pogba's game. He can't do that, right? Um, he needs a team around him that can, so he can kind of shine. And I think what we've seen with Paul Pogba and what we're probably going to see with someone like a Martial, who's the same sort of player, maybe a little bit worse of an attitude, is that once they get put into a team that functions well, that plays to their strengths, we're going to see them flourish and really hit the heady heights. And again, if they don't hit the heady heights, then you know for sure it's them. It's, it's, they're the ones that have the issue. But I think in general, that's what you're going to see going forward. So I think Man United are probably resistant and hesitant to let any of those two go because I think if you want to build a good side, especially you know, off the back of this terrible season we had, we don't really have many good players, right? We have probably, I think Ever said, we maybe have two world-class players that could get into some of the best teams in Europe. It may be De Gea and Paul Pogba. I think you have to keep those players and build the team around them, right? And then kind of flesh it out with some quality in and around it. That's what you have to do. You have to hope that maybe signing a high-quality centre-back, pairing up with a Lindelof for now might do the job. You have to hope that maybe getting in a senior right-back and then having a, maybe a Dallo or an Ashley Young be a cover for that person, right? Ashley, Ashley Young could then, go, could then go back to being like the utility man for the squad, if need be, which I still don't think he should be because he's not good at football. He's just quit and retire right now. You'd hope that maybe getting another youngster to come in at left back to kind of be an understudy or to push Luke Shaw would help. You'd think maybe getting a winger in would maybe kind of alleviate some of the stress in terms of central midfielders, maybe get another centre midfielder in. We could again be somebody to step up for Matic, another centre forward. You can maybe put pressure on Rashford, Lukaku and Martial. If Lukaku basically leaves, you've got two players there, maybe the third. But you need to keep the core of that team. You need to keep it keep the kind of spine of it and kind of build around it overall I think going forward and I just don't again I just don't think uh, letting go of every single player that we have just because we've had a terrible end of season is the right way to go about things I think especially in the beginning when we were winning all those games and losing only a couple there weren't a lot of people that were saying that we should get rid of every single player there were people that were saying that these teams are actually a lot better than what they're playing like Mourinho wasn't getting the best out of them and if we added some quality to this team we could easily finish in the top three easily finish in the top four so now I don't think the conversation has changed really. I still think we're probably the fourth, maybe third best team in the league. Um, if if we're on song, right? If we're doing what we're meant to be doing, we're probably that's where we are now at the moment. And we have to kind of slowly but surely build up to becoming the third the third best team in the league. Then maybe the second and then try maybe slowly but surely challenge for the title. But we can't be letting go of our star players because letting go of someone like a Pogba, you can't, I, I can't, I have no guarantees, I have no faith that if we let go of a Pogba that we have the people in place in our, in our club that could go out and sign a replacement or replacements. I don't think we have it in us, right? Um, we all remember that season where we saw Cristiano Ronaldo and we bought, you know, Valencia Young and Obertan, right? Like we bought like three terrible players, um, all kind of over the hill. O Owen gave us a couple of amazing moments. Obertan, for instance, was you know completely forgettable, and Valencia was you know dog shit after about two years. So I have no faith that the team, the club, could actually go out and sign adequate players that could kind of replace Pogba or add that kind of star power into our team. 
if that if we do the only way it could change if we get a football director in but that conversation of football directors kind of slowed down now no one's really talking about it it seemed like a bit of a a media exercise to kind of quell the dissatisfaction amongst the fans that's what it seems like to me i don't think there ever was a possibility of us getting a football director in. i think it was all just a ruse to kind of get us to stop talking and to kind of leave them alone and if it does change, I'll be, you know, again, I said, like I said, if it does change, I'll uh, be the first person to kind of confess and say it's changed. But I don't think that's going to be the case at all going forward. But, you know, you never know what may happen. Um, but, yeah, uh, it's a really good interview. I recommend you check it out. Again, um, Ash, mostly Gary Neville, mostly Patrick's ever doing the talking. Gary Neville kind of doing the probing questions, not really saying anything. There's speculations out there that support allegedly he doesn't say much because he got some money or some dividends out of the glazers because he was part of the class of 92 they have stakes in the club and all that sort of stuff supposedly that's the case which is really disgusting because the only he's only gone after ed Woodard a couple of times really he hasn't said nothing about the glazers and how they manage the team how they manage the club the funds have been made available direction of the club like how they hire the managers going from Moyes to van gaal to Mourinho with no real common theme or lineage in place um, the power that agents had over our club only a couple of seasons ago. Um, again, the this, the way that Mourinho was treated towards the end, he didn't he wasn't able to sign the players he wanted to because you know some of the hierarchy weren't convinced that he was able to turn the season around. And you know, again, imagine Edwardo telling Mourinho he can't sign a player. Like how how does he have the right to tell him to do anything? But again, Gary Neville's you know always going to be that fencer. He's, he's a bit of a you know teachers pet in that regard but it's good to see Patrick Shepard talking about it in some regard but I also think they're a little bit you know deluded as they think that you know Paul Pope wasn't going to come into any kind of stick you know he's our most costly player he's meant to be our tallies man meant to be uh, the focal point of our attack or the focal point the driving force of our attack or driving force of our midfield and he's really flat to deceive over the last um, couple of seats especially since Ibrahim Bridge kind of left but you know what can you do in that regard? But yeah, I recommend you check it out. It's a, re- it's a pretty good interview, actually, going, go, uh, talking about it. Um, again, you don't really get to hear Man United legends talk like this so openly because, you know, most of the media is made up of um, ex-Liverpool players or people that, you know, played a couple of times for Liverpool and all of a sudden have turned into diehard Liverpool fans. But it's good to see some some kind of parity, some balance in the coverage of Man United in the media now going forward. Let's play a little bit of it, actually, and see what you're to say. <laughs> I'm not afraid to say that. Which players are you talking about? I'm saying, like, I have nothing against him, but Sanchez, when I saw the deal of Sanchez, that's when I say the Man United history just goes down. Because he had Manchester City. They were, of of course, less money. But he was going to get a better football than Man United. I'm sorry about that. Because City playing a better football. Yeah, the manager of Guardiola. So he really improved. So I want to know which reason for real go to Manchester United, you know. Don't tell me he go because he loved Manchester United when he was a kid or there's two reasons. Maybe the money and also because maybe he wants to be the number one. You know, he goes to Manchester, he says not any big play. Yeah, I think that was the that was the oddest signing that we had, isn't it, going forward. I think we had um especially in the back of the Martial signing, or maybe with Rashford too. I think initially most United fans were a bit well, obviously excited about this possibility of Sanchez coming into our team because, you know, whenever we played Arsenal, Sanchez was one, the, one of their best players. He always never to be scored against us. He was a very impactful, a driving force, a player that you couldn't ever really get a grip of. He kind of reminded me of Luis Suarez in that regard. He was super tenacious, never stopped running, always kind of putting pressure on the defenders. So on paper, it seemed like a good idea. But then when you analyse a bit further, you saw that Martial had limited playing time when Ibrahimovic came in. He kind of was pushed out to the wide, to to the flanks, and kind of had to cut back in. You saw he had limited playing time when Lukaku got signed, and Sanchez comes in, and you think to yourself, like we have some really talented forwards in our team in Rashford and, and Martial who are going to be put out to put out wide to accommodate these players coming in who aren't necessarily the, who kind of or are, who are kind of at odds with how we want to play, right? If you've got Lukaku, you can't necessarily play Rashford and Martial together because Lukaku needs an actual out-and-out winger to kind of whip balls into the box early to see his runs, right? Um, a player that Lukaku can actually read. Um, Martial and Rashford are going to cut in a lot. They're going to faint. They're going to go across the goal. There's not going to be that um, traditional wing player of getting down a ball and then hitting the balls into the area. So it didn't really make much sense that we were going for Sanchez because essentially he was, you know, uh, a, a melange of those 
two kind of players, right? And a kind of uh, someone that can go down the line and whip a ball in, someone that can play through the middle, someone that can also play in number ten. It just didn't make any sense why we got him in the first place. And I guess um, when you then you analyze the fact that Man City were in for him, and you look at how Man City play, he would probably fit their team and their style of the football a lot easier than he would have fit ours. And in the end, look what happened. You know, he turned into a complete dud, a complete shadow of himself, and he hasn't never really looked. At, looked, he ever, he's never really looked like the player that he promised he's going to be. And I guess that's something that we have to thank the the Glazers for in that regard, because they basically signed him for marketability, right? One of the most well-known Premier League players out there. Um, I'm, I'd imagine hugely popular in South America. Probably sells, you know, a you know a good chunk of jerseys, right? Maybe in the millions of dollars um, number of jerseys. His social media. Is something that they would be a fan of too. He's got those two dogs. He plays a piano, all that kind of corny bullshit stuff. But everything that's not to do with football had probably decisions to do with him playing and signing for our club. Yeah, and be the star. So that's why it's not like I'm protect, protecting Paul. But when people like yesterday, you know, the incident happened with the fan, they're killing Paul. He's the best scorer, best assist. I know you can maybe question sometimes his leadership and everything. Maybe the last few games you, you want Paul to score the winning goal. So that's why maybe people criticize Paul right now. He's been the best player of, of the season. But just I agree. But the weird thing too, you know what? He doesn't speak you know, as a media. He doesn't say anything for the most part. He might sit down with Sky Sports after games, but he doesn't speak to the media at all. Zero. So it's interesting that we read so much into this guy, this mercurial figure, who, ne- who for the most part keeps his counsel. You know, for the odd dancer video here and there with his mum and his brothers, that's about it. We don't really get to see him say anything regarding his time at United and how he's been treated and stuff. Like, we got a bit of fractious talk from him when he was under Mourinho, but for the most part, we don't hear nothing. So, yeah, again, it's going to be interesting summer going forward. I'll just see what happens. We've been linked again with Nicolas Pepe, I've seen on, in the papers, uh, the Lil Winger, who's, you know, had a really good season. Um, we've been linked to Jaden Sancho, supposedly he wants Champions League football, which, you know, we can't offer. So it's going to be interesting to see what we, what we do. I don't really, I'm not really a big believer in the signings. are going to be all the difference. I think it's going to be the right signings, the right kind of attitude change, the right tactics, the right kind of preseason. That's really going to determine how and how we start and how we finish the next season going coming forward. But yeah, I don't know. I'm not really holding out any hope to be completely honest. Um, 